this morning, Father, to worship you, to hear your word, Lord. Father, you are God of wonders. You are, we can't fathom who you are. We just know that you are life. We just know that your word speaks life. Your word gives us peace. It gives us direction. It's hard to just understand who you really are. But I know outside of you, Lord, it's just destruction. So I thank you for the peace that you give us, Lord. Pray that you enjoyed the worship today, that you heard from the hearts of everybody here today, Lord. And I pray that your scripture would speak to us today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. How's everybody doing this morning? See, we're missing a chunk of the church, man. A chunk of them are at the coast. Some just started vacation. Some barely made it back from the coast. Our sound girl, the video girl back there, sprang her ankle. Pray for her. <laughs> uh, today we're going to talk... Um, we're going to start off in Romans 12, 1 and 2 again, like last week. Except we're going to just kind of look at the second part of that verse. And again, just like last week when we were talking about the men and what God expects us and His definition of who we're supposed to be. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove... What is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? And I was thinking about it this week, and I thought, prove. And it's not, you're not proving God's word is valid to him. He already knows that. If we're not conforming to the world and we're renewing our mind, we're proving that God's word is true. And people will see that. And they start to inquire, why are you different? So it says, don't conform, renew your mind. Prove what is right and what is acceptable to, to God. The second verse we're going to look at in today's Ladies' Day. Yesterday, we, last week, it was about men because God has put a big responsibility on men, period. And everything falls on us. It starts with us, stops with us. But ladies have a... God's called you something from you also. And... Uh, I have seven sisters, most of y'all know. My mom has uh, probably eight sisters. So I've been around women all my life. Um, I've seen what the world does with them. I see what they go through. And it's always bothered me ever since I was little. And I always ask the Lord, you know, hey, even when I was little, if you would just protect my, my sisters, that would really be nice of you, you know. But it doesn't really work that way. How it works is our individual relationship with the Lord. And at the time, I'm asking him just a blanket cover. And I can ask him that. But as I grow up and I spend time in this, bottom line, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And you'll get out of life whatever you put into it. So it's, it's something close to me, and it means a lot. And... It talks about in Ephesians 5, 22, 25. And that'll be the gist of our passage today. In Ephesians 5, 22, 5. And for all the ladies in the house, I'd circle this thing. Because your, your joy is dependent on this thing that you do it right. It says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And don't worry about the submit thing. You'll get that later. But submit, your, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And then everybody usually forgets, and the men always just go over 25. It says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So we still have a lot of responsibility as men. But women, you're supposed to be submissive. And that goes against culture, period, right? Nod your heads. Totally against culture, because you're supposed to be independent. You don't need a man. 
you can survive on your own. But that's not what God's word says. So you've got to look at that. So last week was don't conform to the world for the guys. And today it's don't conform to the world for the women. From the time we raise our daughters, they're influenced by us, by the men and women in their lives, and what they see, and by the world. And I started thinking about that. And I thought, how many Disney and Pixar movies have I seen with my daughters? How many of y'all seen a lot? One, two, or a lot? Everything they have out there, right? Cinderella, Aladdin, Mermaid, Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, all that stuff. They all have a knight in shining armor. They all have the version of the world of the knight in shining armor. They all have the little damsel in distress looking for, a, you know, who's going to save me. So they're ingrained in this all through their childhood. And it seems innocent, right? It's just a cartoon. It's a nice little story. But not one of them ever eludes to Christ, to God. Anything that has to do with Christianity. So it, it, it shapes the way they think from a young age. And who, who's the one that's designing all this? If we go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, it says we're all born sinners, right? We're all born that way. So we're the same as the people that design these movies. If they're not Christian, they're designing what they think is right. And it's influencing all of our culture. The movies are, the commercials are. And if it wasn't influential, do you think they'd spend their, so much money on commercials? They know that if they show it to you enough times, you're going to buy something. Or it's going to lead you in that direction to buy a product within Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson, whoever it is. You're going to see it and eventually you're going to go buy it. You don't even know why. But... They're the ones that are creating this stuff. They're the ones that are influencing our kids. And for us, for, for men, they're watching how do we treat the women in our lives? How do we treat our daughters, our other daughters, our, our uh, wives, our aunts, our mothers? They watch all that, and they learn from that. And then they think, well, that's what a man is supposed to be, and that's their version of it. And then we have just single parents. Who's influencing their kids? Single moms. Who's the role model, the male role model, the Christian role model? I think that's something that the church really needs to pray about on how we help those families. How we help them because somebody's going to influence those kids. And so as, the little, as girls grow up all the way till the time they leave this planet, they already know that they're going to go to high school. They're going to finish it. They're going to attend college. They're going to find a job. They're going to start a career. And for some of them, they're already thinking they're going to have kids. And their view of men, what they've seen as they're growing up, is we're supposed to be protectors, providers. We're supposed to be loyal and honest. We're supposed to be independent from our parents. I don't know if I see a lot of the can't leave the house for some reason. Man, you're supposed to grow up, and you're supposed to step up. You don't live with your parents anymore. And young girls are looking at this. They think that we're going to be career-oriented, that we have goals, that we're loving and patient, that we're monogamous. It just automatically happens that way, Christian or not. It's just going to be that way. It's always been like that on TV until you get past the cartoon age. We're supposed to be respectful. So that's what the world is defined to our children. They define the relationships that they have. They define the dating, what it's going to be like, and they define marriage. And the reality is, they tell them, just make friends. It doesn't matter who your friends are. Just have friends. You don't want to be lonely. You want to have friends. So they don't define it. Just have friends. Dating, you watch after they grow up. And it always strikes me with that little young girl. I won't mention her name. She grew up with uh, Disney. She's in there. She's having a blast. Everybody's buying her records. Her, what do you call them? What do you want to call it? CDs? Uh, they're streaming her music, whatever the case may be. And she was on fire. But when she crosses the line into adulthood, commercialism gets a hold of her. Well, now you've got to start dressing this way and dressing that way because you need to keep selling and you need to keep selling. She's influencing all these girls. 
they think that's normal. They took an innocent young person and they just put it to her. And then she has to prove I'm not that innocent little goody goody. I'm this, just like the world. And that's the way we're influenced constantly. And that's what our kids see. It's an illusion that we see over and over. It never changes. And all of it, I promise you, and you know it, leads to destruction in one way or another. And even if you make it through a decent life, when you close your eyes and you stand before the king and you didn't know him, it's for nil. You're not going to heaven. So one way or the other, good life, crazy life, influenced by whatever, we're going to stand before the Lord. And everything that we do and watch, if it's not driven by God, we are going to fail. We are going to pay a price. We're supposed to not conform. We're supposed to be transformed. And what I see with young ladies all the time, across the board, I see a lot of them grow up in a Christian home. And they're reading. Their parents have a, a, an influence on them. But it still comes down to that one-on-one. -on -one. Somewhere down the road, it's got to change between them and, and God. They have to believe and they have to understand. So they grow up in this environment. And they read and everything. They spend time with the Lord. They've learned the importance of the relationship with the Lord. They learn from their parents. They learn from the church. But they still got a lot of the worldly stuff coming in and influencing them. They know that their parents pray for them in all kinds of life moments. When they're in school, when they have a big test, with their friendship issues, their insecurity issues, they're praying, they're seeking, they're trusting. And in reality, as you grow up like that, you know God has your back, right? It's peaceful. It's a safe house. And we, we know the impact of that relationship with the Lord we know the importance of it. We know how we're supposed to be dependent on Christ. And we know the importance of that relationship and not losing it. And then reality hits. It's a, I just thought, then why would you marry somebody or date somebody who does not have those same attributes? The same way you see God, the same way you saw your parents. And if you didn't have that upbringing, it still comes down to a one-on-one. -on -one. Still comes time down to spending time with the Lord. Why would you entertain anybody that does not have the Lord up here like you did growing up or like you do now that you've become a believer and you see the difference? Why would you mess with anybody outside of that's not seeking the same thing you're doing? Why would you ever, and you got to look at um, that submission word. Why would you ever fall under submission to someone that doesn't value Christ the way you do? That doesn't seek out wisdom or God's plan for his life. You are wasting your time. And if you've already been down the road to, and it ends up in destruction, it's going to go there again. You have to fall in love with the Lord. Like I told, mentioned last week, the Lord wants all of me. I want your marriage, Raj. I want you to chase me like you want me to fix your problem. For six weeks, eight weeks, I've been going through this stuff thinking, I got to chase the Lord more through him, his only life. His word doesn't lie. And that's what you all got to do and stop falling for the world's version of a good man or a good boyfriend, a good friend. Do what God's word says to do or there's a penalty. And I hear this all the time. I used to hear it from my sisters. And I hear it from ladies at work, young ladies, and I think I hear it from my daughters, but I'm not going to point you out. <laughs> and he says he's a Christian, and I'm like, everybody's a Christian. <laughs> Everybody says they're a Christian. That doesn't cut it with me, man. Well, he goes to church. I don't care. I don't care if he's a Christian. He goes to church. He's of a different religion. And he says it doesn't matter. He's okay with me attending my church. I don't care. And you shouldn't care. When your kids tell you that, parents say, oh, I don't care. He knows he needs to get back in church. He's going to start coming with me. Now you're the Savior. The Savior should be up there, not sitting next to him. He's going to start going because he's with me now. 
He's going to start looking for the right church. Oh, he's tired of church because of all the hypocrites. He's, and there's just different religions, man. I grew up Catholic, so I've heard, well, he's, he, he's a Catholic, or he's a Muslim, he's a Mormon, and he doesn't care where our kids will end up going. We've already talked about that. Yeah, he may not care. But I guarantee you when the mother and the grandmother says, hey, you're going to raise your kids the way we raised you. They need to go to this church or that church, which is a totally different religion that has all kinds of other stuff besides Jesus Christ being Lord and Savior. That's where your kids are going to go. Because if not, you're going to have a conflict with your husband now. So you have a huge issue. And don't think it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. So you're going to end up sending your kids somewhere where they don't want to go, or you really, in, you know they shouldn't go, but you're already married. So why would you marry somebody like that? For us as Christians, you know, the Lord, He was always telling Israel, don't marry outside of your heritage, don't marry outside of your beliefs, because it causes problems. How many times have we seen that? It doesn't lie. He doesn't lie. It's going to cause problems. And yet we do it. For us, New Testament Christians, we're supposed to have a relationship with Him. So when you have a relationship with Him, there is no middle ground. There is no giving. There is no, He's going to change. He's going to be all right. He's got, He's a nice guy. He opens my door. He says He loves me. He writes me letters. He does this. He, all that nice stuff. So what? Is he a Christian or not? Because everybody says they're a Christian, or some will flat out tell you they're not. But an actual believer will have fruit, and he'll have the fruit before you even show up. Because that's how you're going to know, because everybody can talk. So why would you marry? For y'all that grow up in a house that have parents like that, that's wonderful. Pay attention to what you've been taught. Pay attention to what you've been reading. And for the single ladies here and, and the ones that have been divorced, our church needs to start a group, a small group, that they have that in common and they help each other and they encourage each other. And the next time they find a boyfriend, somebody they're going to marry, that group can go over there and, hey, let's see your application. <laughs> it takes the pressure off of her having to make that decision. You know what? I don't know. I'm going to have the group meeting. We need a small group. We need a group in church that helps those people because they've already been in it. But who's going to lead that? I don't know. But I think the church needs something like that. Because if not, every guy says he's a Christian. Everybody's a Christian. I'm getting tired of hearing that. It makes me laugh. I almost laugh at when somebody's, I'm a Christian. Oh, really? Tell me about it. Marry the one that Christ has for you. If you can be patient, which you can't, without the Lord helping you along this way to be patient, so that's another gift from Him, you need to be patient so that you can prove what is good and acceptable and perfect. What is the will of God in your life? And then you can share that story with somebody else. We're not supposed to conform to this world. Husbands, we're supposed to love our wives the way Christ loved the church. A man needs to be following and needs to be driven by God's word. Way before he ever enters the picture, he should already have fruit by the way of relationship with the Lord. Christian fellowship is a priority for him. Respect for his parents, cares for others, but most importantly, puts Christ first. That's what you're looking for, not what we've been in taught, not what's been ingrained in us through movies and all that kind of stuff. If you marry outside of your, your belief, outside of looking for a Christian man because you are already a Christian woman, the sad thing is you got to stay in that relationship. You're not supposed to divorce. You opened the door, you married the wrong person, now you got to pray for that person because you're the Christian. God will work through you. But do you really want to do that? But that's what happens if you marry a non-Christian because it is going to come back to haunt you. 
And you won't be praying with your husband. You'll be praying for your husband, for his problems and possibly for his salvation. He doesn't know the Lord the way you do. So why would you open that door? And if you really look at the Bible, and that's a whole other discussion that Kevin would have to go into because it's deep. If you really open the door and you're in a bad marriage, you can't leave the guy. You can't divorce him. Only if he's cheated on you. Now we can work on the issues if he's abusive, physically violent and all that kind of stuff. We can work on that. But why would you open that door? You're not even supposed to divorce in that situation. Well, he's not what I thought he was going to be. Well, that's too bad because you already knew what you were supposed to be looking for. So there's repercussion for your actions. And it sounds cold, and I understand that. But it's the repercussion of me talking to my daughters. You did that. Whatever the situation is, I warned you. You knew better. You know better. Why would you open that door? So it falls back on you. But because we're ingrained in a certain way, we're, we're Christians, but yet we're influenced by the world so much. The word says, do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Trust God. Like he wants us to be driven, following him as men. He wants you to marry a man that loves him more than he loves you. Your boyfriend, your potential husband, your happiness <laughs> relies on his relationship with the Lord. I guarantee you that. If he has a relationship with the Lord, he's going to be treating you the way he's supposed to. If he doesn't, you're going to be sad. And you're going to have people praying for you. You are probably already pray for other people that are jacked up. Why open that door in your life? That guy has to be following the Lord, and he has to put the Lord before you. As important as you think you are, and we all think we're important, God is more important. And in a relationship, he is utmost important. John just shared a story, how important Christ is to him, what God is. He's got to go and ask him, I need help here. I've never encountered this, but at least he knew where to go. Not a health self, uh, self-help book, not Google, not Wikipedia. Because if you're not saved, that's where you're going. You're going to go look for advice somewhere else. You've got to have somebody that loves the Lord more than you. A God-driven man will follow the Lord. He'll have fruit to show. He'll have a relationship of action and not just words. And even though he says he's a Christian... You've got to remember, if he walks, talks, and smells like the world, then he's not a believer. A believer no longer conforms. We don't change overnight, but we do transform. We do start to change as we spend time with the Lord. We're no longer identified with the world by their standards. To follow the Lord is to go against the grain, to go against the world's view. And I guarantee you, ladies... The guy that does that will stand out like a sore thumb. And then that's the one you're going to bring to all of us and say, hey, start praying for so-and-so. I think he might be saved. <laughs> I like him. I think he's the one. Well, if he's the one, that Holy Spirit that's in you is going to have peace. But if your parents don't have peace and your friends don't have peace, you better figure out where your peace is coming from. Is it coming just from your little brain that says, ah, oh, it's okay, I can look past that little part, that little part. All those little parts add up to a big part. And then you got a problem. That's why you got to stay surrounded in community. These are big decisions. you got to be praying. you got to know what you're looking for. And don't forget, you're no different from us. If you follow your fleshly desires, just like we do as men, Guys, we know we pay a price. And it's a heavy price for us when we mess up. Well, it's no different for y'all. Because the problem is when you get married to somebody you shouldn't have married and you end up having kids, either way, if you have kids, you're going to end up with all the kids. Because that's the way it usually plays out. The father or the live-in can always walk away. 
they can always start over and it's always your fault that they left. The next lady doesn't know that. You probably, most likely, you end up with no home and no money. You end up having to move in with the family. And the sad thing is, for a lot of women, money is so tight, they'll remarry just to make ends meet because it's so crazy. I am hurting in all kinds of ways and I just need to f provide for my kids. That guy looks good enough. We get along great, I'm gonna marry him because she's got money problems. They're overwhelmed by everything that's going on. And the cycle will most likely continue from one marriage to the next. Nothing changes until we follow the Lord and we have that personal relationship with the Lord. Outside of that, it's a vicious cycle that, man, you, you don't think it's gonna end, but it will. But you gotta put your feet down and cry out to Jesus and change. He's the only one that can change us. So I started um, looking. We watched this porch thing. It's, it's, a, it's a ministry out of Dallas. Runs underneath the big church called Watermark. And I wanted to continue with some more stuff, but then I saw the porch this past Tuesday with uh, the young adults that come to our, our house. We watch it. And then we always talk about whatever the topic is that day. It's always heavy stuff. It calls out the guys like crazy constantly. It calls out the girls sometimes. And all the time it's, it's our fault because we're not walking with the Lord. So on Tuesday night we watch this porch. We watch it live. On Wednesday night, uh, Vicki and Kirk, they have another group, the C2 group. Um, they watch archived sermons. They'll watch the series and all that. So we watch it live. They watch what's already been played the week before, the year before, whatever. Um, our age groups do differ a little bit. Theirs runs from high school, right out of high school, um, and while you're in college. Ours runs a little bit almost when you're getting out of college. It'll probably run into the 30, 32 age group. And then you become something else and go into another ministry. But we'll have to pray for somebody to lead that one too. But so those are the two groups. And I found the interest. I found this sermon interesting Tuesday because he's talking to to the girls. It's all about the title of it is lonely. And uh, what do we do when we're lonely? And he ends up using the same scripture that I used last week and this week. It's not I I. It's what the Lord laid on my heart. Let me be clear about that. The Lord's given me something six weeks ago and started it, and it's finishing today. All through the six weeks, He's just pruning me, refining me, and it, it's crazy what, what the Lord does. And then this week, He shows us this, minute, this uh, sermon, and it's all got Scripture in it. You know, it's just from the Lord. And these guys, when they're preaching, they preach every Tuesday night. They have about 4,000 young adults that show up every Tuesday night. So I went one time, two years ago, me and Josh here, because he kept bugging me about it. I told him, I'm not going. All he want to do is sell something. Adam and I wasn't going. Well, things changed. I had an open weekend. I told him, all right, let's go buy two tickets. Let's go. I'm going to see why in the world 4,000 kid, young adults keep showing up when they got all kinds of other things they can be doing, right? And I go in there, and the first 10 minutes, they're asking everybody, so why are you here? Why are you here? And, Everybody's got some reasons. And I told them, I'm here to see what the heck are you doing? Well, you got video games, arcade, you got food. What's bringing these guys in all the time? Or is this God-driven thing? I, you know, I got to know. Hey, good question. By the 11th or 12th minute, it's all about God. When they start talking, you know it's about God. So like 4,000 people on average show up every Tuesday night to hear this kind of sermon. And instead of plagiarizing what he talked about Tuesday, because it just doesn't play well in my head that, oh, you got it from him, you got it from him, and then I got to struggle up here. If they only knew you got it from him, so hey, so I can have peace in my own mind. I got a video clip that's going to talk about what we're talking about today. It's about 15 minutes long. This guy's name is David, and he's leading the porch now. And this is the kind of stuff they preach about all the time. 
And these young adults are coming because they want something different. I went to that conference a couple of months ago. Four, there's about 3,000 people, 4,000 show up. And I want to tell you that at least 60, 70 percent, maybe even 80 percent of them are women. And I told Mary, why in the world are there so many women here? Because it's open to everybody. It's not geared towards any gender. And in my heart, I just think that the women are looking for something. They're tired of the way things are. So you young men, if you get in gear, start following the Lord, hey, there's plenty out there and they're looking for a godly man. How about that? So this is about 15 minutes long. Uh, and he says some stuff that's funny. If you want to laugh, you can laugh in church. It's not a big deal to laugh in church. The second myth, and probably the most widely held myth, is this. Marriage could fix my loneliness. Marriage could fix my loneliness. Here's the truth. Marriage will address your singleness, not your loneliness. Marriage can fix your singleness, and not even fix your singleness, as though it's something to be fixed. Marriage will address your singleness. It can't touch your loneliness. Those are two entirely different things. The only thing that getting married does, if you're someone who's like lonely, and I hear this all the time from people who are like, I just feel such a loneliness, you'll never understand because you're married, and, and I just feel like I need to get married to someone. They're assuming that marriage would fix my loneliness. Marriage will change your singleness. It will not address your loneliness because loneliness is a heart issue that only God can fix. You can be married and lonely. You can be single and not lonely. You can be single and lonely. You can be married and not lonely. Those two things are not related together. And the God who's there says he does not want you to buy the lie that marriage is meant to be some solution to the heart issues that you have. Marriage will change your singleness status, but it will not change your heart because loneliness is a heart issue. The reality is marriage can add to loneliness. And, and so listen to me very closely. After doing this for the last 10 years, I cannot tell you how heartbroken and how often my heart has broken for the people in my life who because they were so lonely and they thought, you know what, I just need to get married despite the fact that, you know, he's not the best candidate, but he's the one I'm with right now, so let's make it happen. And they end up heartbroken. And the pain of loneliness in marriage far exceeds the pain of loneliness in singleness. And please, 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 believe me, it is better to be lonely today and single than to be lonely tomorrow in marriage. And if you allow that loneliness and that void inside of your heart to lead you to get married to someone out of an attempt to kind of fill that, not only will it not fix your loneliness, it'll amplify it if you marry the wrong person. It's not just similar to this. Um, anyone go to Costco here? Shop at Costco? Okay, that's kind of like a, a dad thing. So there's like five of us here. And... Uh, <laughs> Center market, we'll just go with that. But so for me, uh, in this stage of life, we go to Costco all the time. Like once a week, it's like, hey, we got nothing to do. We're going to Costco. Because it's kind of like going to the zoo with kids. It's like, we'll walk around and we'll eat the samples. What I've discovered about myself <laughs> is that I can't go to Costco when I'm hungry. Because I end up going around and buying things that I don't need to buy because I'm just like, oh man, this you know, apple bacon sausage, this is delicious. I didn't even know that I needed this. Let's get it. And then I go home and I'm like, I, I don't, didn't even come here to buy this. What did we end up with all this stuff that we ended up purchasing? Because I went shopping when I was hungry and it was a bad idea. In the same way it's bad to go shopping when you're hungry, it is a bad idea to go dating when you're desperate. Yeah, whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh, oh, man. I'm, <laughs> that's not just some line, that is the truth. And if you are out there and you are thirsty and you're looking to satisfy something inside of you, I'm being totally serious. If there's a part of you that out of that desperation or hey man, I just feel like lonely on the inside so I'm gonna go looking, you're gonna end up marrying someone that is not who God says. You're gonna end up marrying someone out of that desperation and attempting to cope with that pain of just, man, I want to not be single so bad. So I don't care if they don't exactly add up to God's word. I'm moving forward with this. And you are gonna find yourself more lonely than ever before. Marriage cannot fix your loneliness, but it can add to it. 
And I couldn't be more clear as a guy who's so committed to seeing amazing marriages break out all over this room. You guys get married, make babies, make disciples. It's gonna be amazing. I hope it happens. I hope to give you, be a part of it. And, and truly, there's lots of great options around this room. Lots of probably not great options too, so be careful. But point being, <laughs> as someone who is so deeply committed to hoping all of you end up in amazing marriages someday, I wanna be abundantly clear. You need to make sure that you address the heart issues inside of you before you go dating. Just like you need to make sure you address the hunger inside of you before you go shopping. You need to make sure that you address the heart issues so that you don't allow that desperation to push you to date someone who God says, this is not who you should be in relationship with. This is why the danger of marrying or dating someone who's not a follower of Jesus or not a believer, and by um, believer, I don't mean just they say they're a Christian, I mean they are following Jesus. This is why it's such a bad idea. Or date someone of a different religion, of a different faith. Because if you, you you think loneliness being single, if you marry someone who doesn't share the faith that you have, you are headed for tremendous heartbreak and heartache. I mean, think about it. It's the most intimate part about you. Not only if you marry someone, if, if you're Christian and they're Jewish, not only does that challenge or set up lots of challenges down the road of like, oh, hey, the kids are coming to church now, then they're going to synagogue, and what are we gonna do? Thought we were gonna raise them this way. It's not only logistically a nightmare, it is the most intimate part of you, your soul. And you're saying, hey, this thing that I share, this connection with God, this belief that I have, that he alone is the one that satisfies, that he died in my place, that I can know him, that I'm gonna live forever with him, that most intimate, incredible thing about you. You don't share with the person that you're married to, think about how lonely that is. And you don't, if you know anyone who's in that spot, if they're honest, what happens is their faith either dies in that marriage or their marriage either dies. And either way, it leads to incredible loneliness. And the God who's there does not want you to experience that. Marriage will not fix your loneliness. It will address your singleness. But loneliness is a heart issue. And only Jesus can address that part of you. The best thing to do while you wait right now is to begin to work on the heart, the areas of your life where you're like, I feel like I'm looking for a solution in a man, I'm looking for a solution in a wife, I'm looking for a solution outside of Christ to fill some void, some loneliness that I have. And I think a person could fix it, and it's just a lie. The third and final myth is related to this idea, and it's this. Accepting Christ will fix my loneliness. Accepting Christ will fix my loneliness. Accepting Jesus as the one who came, God, became a man. He died in my place on the cross. He paid for all of my sin, everything that I've ever done in the past, everything I'll ever do in the future, everything uh, that I've ever, every mistake I've ever made. It was all nailed to the cross. He paid for all of it. And then he died and he rose again. He came back alive, showing the payment was more than enough. Excuse me. Accepting that will not fix your loneliness. It is not accepting Christ that will fix it. It is walking with Christ. That is the way that we battle loneliness. Accepting Christ doesn't battle loneliness. Walking with him does. Any more than this. Uh, Three weeks ago or two weeks ago, my wife and I, we joined a gym. Thank you. And uh, (laughs) we're like, summer's here. This is going to be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. Thank you for that support. It's not my mom. Okay. Hey, and... uh, (laughs) <laughs> two weeks ago, we joined a gym, and we haven't been back to exercise yet. <laughs> but we have gone to the pool like eight times. It's just become our pool. <laughs> and, uh, and as crazy as it would be if I stood before you and I was like, hey, here's the deal, uh, or if I went to that gym and I was like, look, we signed up to get in shape, to get fit. We were told that if we signed up with this gym, we would get in shape. And they asked us, well, how many times have you come and used the exercise equipment? None. But that is not the point. We signed up to get in shape. They would say, what is wrong with you? And in the same way that, hey, it's not access to a gym that leads someone to be, you know, in good physical fitness. It is taking advantage of that access and putting it into action that leads that. It is not access to Christ that alone is going to solve your loneliness. It is taking advantage of that access and walking with Jesus on a consistent basis. You cannot express that, hey, uh, if I just accept Christ, you'll spend eternity with God in heaven. That is what the Bible teaches, that if you have true faith, if you confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart God raised from the dead, you shall be saved. But it is not just having access to that relationship with God that's going to allow you to battle loneliness. It is taking advantage of that access and acting on it, walking with him. 
any more than I could expect to be fit by having a membership, by having access to Christ. You cannot expect to battle that loneliness without walking with him consistently. So what do I mean by walking with him? Here's some few things that I've laid out as it relates to walking. One of the first things, if you want to walk with God or walking with Christ, looks like this is not an exhaustive list, but it at least should step you in the right direction. It involves confessing and repenting of sin. Confessing and repenting of sin. That you cannot walk with God without a willingness to confess and turn from, which is what repent means, from sin. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart. Those who seek to purify their heart, those whose hearts have been purified, for they shall see God. In other words, the less pure of heart that you are, the more that you allow sin to infiltrate and define your heart and sit and contaminate your heart, the more that sin is present in your life, it creates a barrier of intimacy with you and God. It was this barrier, sin, being introduced that ultimately was the reason that Adam and Eve and mankind was separated from God. Anytime sin is present, it creates a barrier with a perfect, holy God. So if you continue to sin, some of you, the reason you feel so far from God is because you're addicted to pornography. And every time you close your eyes, you see nudity. You don't see a chance to pray and reflect on God. Some of you are in a relationship and God has just been so clear. Like you, you have like an anxiety about it. You wake up in the middle of the night sweating because you're like, I know that I'm not supposed to be in this, but I'm afraid of what will happen if I break up here. And it's because of a unwillingness to be obedient to him. You feel far from him and he didn't move, you did. And the God who says, will you confess, repent of sin? Will you confess, acknowledge it to God, acknowledge it to him? And in doing so, you'll have a step in the right direction of intimacy being restored with God. Walking with him means just confessing, acknowledging what all of us, we're not perfect people. We need a savior. And so I can confess and repent and turn from that. Second part of walking with him, the second thing I included here is that a constant communication with him or praying to him. What does it look like to walk with God? Like, hey, what, what is it gonna mean if I actually wanna battle loneliness, not accepting, but walking with him? It means I'm gonna confess and repent of sin when, it's, when I see it in my life, when people point it out in my life. It means I'm gonna be in constant communication with you, God. God doesn't want some relationship with you that you see him as either the bell service or as the 911 call, but as a constant walkie-talkie, that he wants a relationship. And all relationship doesn't survive without communication. And he wants you to be in everything that you experience in constant communication with God. Like some of you, 1 Peter 5, verse seven says, cast all of your cares on God because he cares for you. I want you to think about this verse. Everything you care about, he wants you to bring that to him. Like, not just like, hey, God, I'm praying today, and thank you for this food, and I want to pray for all the orphans in Africa, and I want to pray for, you know, sick Aunt Betty. Everything you care about, your anxiety about work, your concern about your friend, your anxiety about what your boss may think of you, the presentation you have coming up, you hope that, uh, you know, you get green lights on the way to work. I don't know if you should pray for that or not, but I know that he wants you to pray And as you do so, he'll align your will to his. But he doesn't want you to hide back and say, like, I can only bring things to him that I can, like, read a verse exactly for this in here of what exactly I'm to pray for. He wants a relationship where you bring everything to him. God, I'm feeling lonely right now. God, I I just want to be married. I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet financially. My roommate's moving out, and I don't have an option of where I'm going to live, and I'm anxious about it. Will you provide a roommate for me? Will you help me to not be anxious? Everything that you feel, I mean, think about that verse. Some of you, you need to hear this more than anything else that I'm gonna say, because anxiety is a part of your story, it's a part of your present. And God says, I want, I care about everything you care about. That's what the verse says. Cast everything, I think they have it on the screens, cast every, all of your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Or your translation has, cast all of your cares on him because he cares for you. Everything you care about, he cares about because he cares about you and he wants you to bring those things to him. Constant communication, not as a bellhop or as a room service, like, hey, can I get this one thing here or 911 only when I'm afraid is she pregnant that I'm praying, but a constant communication to God he wants to have with you. The third thing is it relates to just walking with him and you'll be amazed what happens whenever you do that. Whenever you begin to actually pray with him, your awareness, it's like my awareness of his nearness and his presence over my life is raised. It's like my awareness of how much he cares about me and he cares about the things in my circumstances is raised just by praying more. God, will you help me right now? As I'm about to walk up here and share. We help it to be clear. We help me to get over what people think about me. Will you help me? Whatever those things are in your life, he wants you to bring them to him. The third thing, 
The component of walking with Christ involves trusting and obeying. I'm gonna trust you and obey. I'm gonna follow what your, your word says in here. I'm gonna walk by faith is another way of saying that. I'm gonna trust what you say is right and I'm gonna do it. Romans chapter 12, verse two says, do not conform to the patterns of this world. The behavior of the world, don't conform to what everybody else is doing out there. If everybody's doing it, it's probably not the behavior that should mark you. If it's the, the behavior or the way of thinking that the world has, if it's like this is the common way that people think today, it's probably not the right one for you. Do not conform to the pattern or the ways of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's reading, the, reading God's word and allowing the truth of what it says to transform you, not be conformed into what the world tells you should be. Then you will be able to test when you know what God's will is, which is what the Bible is. When you know what it is, then you'll be able to put it to the test. When you know what he says about sex, when you know what he says about, hey, flee sexual morality, don't allow that to be a part of your relationship, hey, that is a thing saved from marriage, whenever you actually do that and you're like, dude, people actually do that, and you're like, hey, you know what, I'm gonna try it. Whenever you do it, the Bible says, then you'll be able to put it to the test and you will approve what God's will is as good, pleasing, and perfect will. It's like whenever you begin to put it to test, you're like, oh, well, I guess I'll really try this. It's as though the Bible's saying, hey, test me. You're not gonna end up being like, gosh, I got buyer's remorse here. I cannot believe I dated the way God says to date. I really regret my decision there. No one does it, Paul says. You begin to walk according to the ways that God says to walk as it relates to your relationship with other people, as it relates to the way you use your time, your money, your job, the way that you think, alcohol, sexuality. He's like, hey, do, do what I say. Put it to the test. You have a money back guarantee, it works. And you will find, Paul says, you'll be able to test it and you will approve it because it is good, pleasing, and perfect. And I found it interesting to see it Tuesday when the Lord had already given me this like six weeks ago. And then Tuesday night, he's talking to young adults. The Lord is, again, with the same verse we've been looking at. Don't conform transform by the renewing the constant walking with me and I'll change your life so as we get ready to close here in a few minutes I gotta ask you parents are we letting our children know the importance of God's word are we showing them by our actions are they gonna in the future look for a godly man because they understand it. And those that have become believers after that stage in life, you gotta have that relationship with the Lord. He's got somebody for you. Because go back to Ephesians 5. You gotta understand the importance of this. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband the one you're going to marry is the head of you as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives, let you be to their own husband, be submissive to them in everything. Husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Do you understand the importance of it? The Lord gave us that stuff two weeks ago when it started. And he's reiterating again to a young group on Tuesday nights, to a group at our house. Follow me and you won't lose. Stay conformed and you're gonna lose. 